Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, start the briefing with a uh, uh, a long uh, emotional tribute to uh, Colonel Doug Kennett. This is his uh, um, penultimate day in the military. He's retiring tomorrow, as you know, after a distinguished career of 26 years, most of which has been spent in uh, public affairs, Air Force public affairs. He's been the uh, director of the Air Force Systems Command public affairs operation and the uh, director of the media relations desk of the Air Force upstairs and also the director of uh, public affairs for U.S. forces in the United Kingdom. But for the last uh, two and a quarter years, he's been here in the Pentagon running the 31 people in DDI and I think doing a great job. I will miss him personally and I'm sure you'll all miss him as well. I hope you'll be able to come to a ceremony tomorrow. Uh, he is moving on to, uh, I don't know whether you could move on to greener pastures. Um, from your current purple job, but um, uh, he's moving on to McDonnell Douglas, and um, he will, uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, be in touch with many of you from time to time, so you'll have the benefit of his uh, continuing uh, uh, humor and knowledge about things. Which one is the Doug <laughs> <laughs> also like to note that uh, Dick Bridges uh, is here, uh, who is going to replace uh, Doug in a couple of weeks. If you don't know uh, Dick, please please stop by and say hello. Uh, moving on. Secretary Perry will go to Moscow next week on Tuesday to meet with uh, uh, his counterpart, General Rudianov, the Russian defense minister. He will also give a speech to the Duma in favor of START II. Um, it will be... Uh, I think like a congressional hearing here, he'll go and testify in favor of Russian ratification of the START II agreement and take questions from about 100 members in the Russian Duma. And then he will go uh, up to um, uh, uh, Servodninsk in the north, which is the largest uh, submarine manufacturing facility in the world. And uh, along with Senator Nunn and Senator Lugar, uh, participate in a ceremony dismantling a submarine um, uh, in compliance with the uh, START I treaty. As you know, Senators Nunn and Lugar are the authors of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which has uh, 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 helped um, denuclearize uh, two former Soviet states, Kazakhstan and Ukraine, and we expect that Belarus will be the third state to denuclearize um, later this year. He will be back on Friday. And there will be a background briefing tomorrow at 11, here at 10 on the trip. So if you're interested in the trip, show up for it. And with that, I'll take your questions. Charlie. Um, two quick questions. Number one, will Nana Lugar <coughs> appear before the Duma with him? Um, I believe they uh, will be at that event. Um, but uh, the, uh, the secretary will be doing the testifying and answering the questions. And number two, on the chemical arms, I think it says, uh, has the CIA indicated further when the model will be over here? And if not, have they indicated, given you any indications at all, how many thousands of extra troops uh, it might uh, indicate be in some danger? No, let me uh, explain to you where, where the CIA model stands. Um, the. Uh, Director of Central Intelligence, John Deutsch, decided that um, this model should be subject to uh, peer review. And uh, he and uh, John White, are the Deputy Secretary of Defense, are in the process of appointing a panel of uh, experts who will review uh, not only the model itself, but the whole challenge of how do you analyze dispersion patterns uh, of an event that happened uh, five years ago, five and a half years ago. Um, I hope this will be done relatively quickly. Uh, our hope is that it will be done relatively quickly, but there will be um, a, t a time to appoint this peer review panel and have them go through the uh, uh, both the computer model and the evidence that we have 
the uh, CIA model is actually a variant of a model that was developed by the Army. Um, and as I say, the Director Deutsch decided that it should be subject to peer review, so that's the next step. What do you mean by reasonably quickly? What do you mean by reasonably quickly? Days, weeks, months? Okay. Well, sir, I would guess not months. I would guess probably weeks. But given, um, uh, given my, uh, my inability to predict this so far, um, I'm not going to allow you to pin me down to a precise time on this. But it will be done as quickly as it can be done. We're dealing with scientists. Um, uh, they'll need some time to ramp up. Uh, they'll need some time to come in and, and uh, survey the information. Video on this information? Sorry? Some, will someone shoot video of this group meeting? Because we wanted to get video of this group. You want to see a bunch of scientists sitting around a table? Uh, I, I doubt it, but um, we'll, uh, the group it doesn't exist yet. It's in the process of being formed. What do you mean formed by, by peer review? Are they outside peers or yeah, DOD yeah. peers versus no, no, CIA these peers? Are, these what are scientists from outside the department and outside Why the CIA. Why did they need to do that? Why did the uh, Deutsch think there was a need to have that review? I, I, I think he felt that there were significant questions raised by the uh, um, uh, raised by the complexity of the task. And he just wanted to make sure that we had the best people available looking at this. Was not satisfied with the first model that came out? You know, peer review is an extremely uh, common event in science. Um, it would be equivalent to uh, um, reporters uh, uh, submitting stories to editors. Uh, it happens all the time. It's natural. And uh, I don't see anything out of the ordinary here. We, as you know, have submitted many of the scientific studies that the Army has done on Persian Gulf um, illness to peer review as well. But since, a, since a peer review wasn't initiated in the, in the early rounds of this, doesn't that indicate that he wasn't satisfied with the results? I, th I would say he wants these results to be as, uh, uh, as well reviewed as possible, and he set up a program to do that. I think it's important um, to realize that we will never have a precise, definitive picture of how chemical agents may have been dispersed on March 10, 1991, from Camasilla. It's impossible to uh, go back and reconstruct precise wind patterns. It's impossible for us even to know how many weapons were exploded. It's impossible for us to know how many jumped out of the pit how many of them um, uh, propelled themselves into the sand and buried themselves, um, how many didn't explode at all. Uh, we, we, we have to make a bunch of assumptions. We also have to make assumptions, as I say, about wind patterns. Uh, so there is real complexity to this task. And the the CIA has modelers who have worked on this. We have modelers who have worked on it. We do have some um, experience from experiments that's, that have been done. But the Director of Central Intelligence felt that it was best, since this obviously is going to be held to great scrutiny, to set up a team that would review what the agency's done. And that's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. Todd. Do you know how many people are going to be on this team? I do not, no. Was there a peer review of the model for Bunker 73? Um, uh, was. There was not, no. That, of course, is a different situation. And uh, in that because it happened in a bunker, we assume that the dispersion was much less than it was from an open pit. Well, it's, uh, let me ask you about that. Uh, it's one man's computer model. It's not a worst case scenario. It makes a lot of assumptions. Why not have that peer review? If you're going to have a peer review, why don't you have that one peer review? There's a lot of debate at, at the Presidential Advisory Committee on the, uh, the way that was modeled. Uh, you're talking about March 4th. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, they may well look at what happened on March 4th. Um, as I say, this, is, this decision was just made in the last couple of days, we're in the process of putting a, uh, a committee together. It hasn't gotten a former char formal charter yet. It could well be included. Is it uh, possible now that <coughs> the conclusions out of this will not be made public until after the presidential elections? 
Uh, I'd say it's uh, quite uh, it's probably likely that we will one way or another, whether we have the CIA model or not, have more to say about uh, how to deal with possible chemical exposure in the next few weeks. Well, well, Ken, you, you've, said, you, <coughs> Ken, you've said that you've said that there's still no indication that you haven't found anybody that, that who apparently has become sick from chemical weapons or nerve gas or anything else. How about these 150 engineers, the engineers who were involved in the actual blast? Have they been checked carefully? And have you not found any any problems with them? They were the ones who they were the ones who were closest to this. Uh, you're talking about the people at March 4th. The people who actually that's right. Well, as I say, we have not yet found um, a clinical link between exposure to chemicals and Gulf War illness, but that's the issue, and that's what we're looking at. We're in the process of there were, um, we think, um, uh, about 1,100 people who uh, could have been in a, in a wide area after Camasilla 1 uh, who could have been subject to low-level exposure. We're trying to contact them by phone. We've contacted about 500 people so far. Ken, rather John. than contact these people on the phone and do all this, I mean, why not, why has the Secretary Perry not put forth a formal investigation rather than this informal way of looking into it? Well, we've had a very extensive program going on for a number of years. This isn't new since June. Um, we've had the uh, comprehensive clinical evaluation program going on. Uh, a number of people have registered with that, well, over 25,000 people have registered with the Veterans Administration. We have been doing our best to study uh, the causes of what are known, what is known as Persian Gulf illness, or Gulf War illness. Um, as the Institute of Medicine report pointed out today, uh, the one that was released today, uh, so far, we have not been able to find a clinical link between uh, the, a, a single cause for the Gulf War illness, nor have we yet been able to find any clinical link between exposure to chemicals and the symptoms that people are talking about. That's not to say we won't. We don't know. It's one of the things we're looking at. We don't know what we will find. It seems it would be, it would be important to at least go out and uh, do a, medic, a thorough medical exam of each one of these 150. Well, we, first of all, uh, we may get to that. We haven't gotten to that point yet. The way it's worked is that people who have symptoms, who uh, believe that they're suffering from an illness, have had the opportunity to come and register themselves in a clinical evaluation program and be uh, subject to certain examinations and data collection. Uh, we have not reached the point of reaching out to uh, every single person who served in the Gulf and giving him or her comprehensive medical examinations. It's been more people responding. We are in the process of reevaluating the best way to uh, figure out what happened and the best way to provide care in light of the new information. That's been the point of what's been going on here for the last couple of months. Um, it's a massive undertaking. But we're, that's what we're looking at, and that was some of the white initiatives of several weeks ago were designed to do that. Ken, I'm, I'm somewhat puzzled by what you said a moment ago, that prior to the final peer review, you expected more information to come out about potential exposure uh, to a group. What, no, I would say more information on how we're dealing with the question of potential exposure. Um, I wouldn't... Um, uh, the... That's what I meant to say. Um, yeah, last week you had some rough, I don't know whether you would call them estimates or some numbers that you As I recall, what happened last week was that I was asked to give a range. I was asked about a range, and the range was 15,000 to 100,000. I said that there would be, um, in the end, uh, larger numbers of people exposed than what we had said. We have always, from the beginning, when we announced the 5,000 figure, said that the number could go higher. We haven't completed the analysis yet. The analysis will show us, will give us a sense of where this, this, uh, where chemical agents may have drifted over troops and how many troops were under that pattern. 
the question is how do you determine what the pattern is? What do you, how do you determine what the dispersion pattern is? That's what the CIA has been struggling to do, and that's what the, uh, the experts will review when they're constituted as a group to review it. Yet you have no doubt that it will be at least three times as large as the five. Oh, I, I, I assume that it will end, we are going to end up with, a, uh, um, with basically a graduated uh, picture where the people closest, obviously, are those subject to um, greatest interest, and those farther away will be um, uh, subject to much less exposure, if any. I mean, much lower levels of exposure. The question is, how do you graph that? I mean, how if you if you move from from if you just went a, a, a color spectrum from say very dark blue to very light blue, dark blue being constant possible um, uh, most likely exposure to light blue being least likely exposure. The question is, where do you? Where do you array people under that color spectrum? That's what the CIA has been looking at. If you go out to, and depending on the assumptions of wind patterns, how much ordnance was blown up, there's going to be a range of possibilities here. Um, the other week, uh, there have been big figures floating around. I have no idea what it's going to turn out to be. But obviously, under the worst case estimate, with every single Katusha rocket filled with sarin going off and spraying sarin into the atmosphere with a certain wind assumption, you're going to have a much larger number than you would under the least case or the, the best case assumption where only a, a small number of the rockets go off and some of them explode into the bank of the pit and there's very limited wind. That's the type of thing we're looking at and, and it will be arranged. There will be no definitive picture of what happened, and we will never be able to say that, um, uh, that uh, X thousand three hundred and forty one people um, may have been exposed to agents because so of this. We know and we dispense with uh, this other issue of timing on this and how long it may take. Um, the, there is no political connection to the delay in getting this report out to the public. Uh, that is tied to this presidential election, is that correct? There is zero political connection. And the reason there is zero political connection is it does not help us to delay this. We would like to get this nailed down as soon as possible. We first announced the possibility of low-level exposure in June. We've been struggling to come up with a picture of what that might be, and we're still struggling. But we would like to get this behind us so we can concentrate and get you to concentrate on taking care of people and uh, figuring out what happened to them rather than on, on models which aren't going to be particularly illustrative anyway. Why not just call on Pat just I wanted just to <coughs> narrow down that question. As I understood his question, uh, you're not going to have this model ready before November 5th, is that right? I For don't know. I do not know. I have no idea. Is that, well, you indicated you were going to have some information before that, but not the model. The I said review. I do not know when the model will be ready. A couple, two weeks, three weeks? Is it Not possible? knowing means I can't give you a time. Is it possible it will be after November 5th? <clears throat> I do not know when the model will be ready. It's possible? Then? I can't say. I don't know. We would like to get this done as quickly as possible. Look, it doesn't help us to be out here. There have been there have been uh, there have been estimates in the press that have gone up to uh, uh, extremely large numbers, and um, uh, it doesn't do us any good to have this uncertainty hanging out there. We would like to get the best estimate we can and go on with our program. Uh, if on the March four uh, event. Dr. Joseph said four to 5,000 troops were in the area, uh, the radius on March 4, uh, and that he was identifying, uh, he had identified and was contacting these units. Uh, last Tuesday, we asked to have those units identified. Can you identify those units from March 4? Uh, yes, the uh, units from March 4th were the 37th engineers of the uh, 18th um, Airborne Corps from Fort Bragg, the, 370, the 307th Engineer Battalion from the 82nd Airborne Division of Fort Bragg, 
the 60th um, Explosive Ordnance Detachment and the 146th Explosive Ordnance Detachment, and I don't have their, their homes yet, but we will get them, and the 450, 50th Civil Affairs Battalion, which is a, uh, uh, an Army Reserve group associated with the 352nd Civil Affairs Command in Riverdale, Maryland. Those were the units we believe were um, in the area on March 4th. But that was that was for 1100. That was identified some weeks ago. That was for 11. That's what you, the 1100. What about the four to five thousand? The five thousand, my understanding, relates to the um, the people who are in a 25 uh, kilometer area um, on March 10th, and the five thousand relates to the March 10th explosion of the pit. Joseph was wrong in his testimony then. Well, my understanding of what we announced on September 20 and September 18th is that that uh, 5,000 uh, applied to that. I will go back and double check that. So it's only 1,100 then. We're in the, the 25 kilometer radius on March 4th. Um, I will have to check the actual radius, but 1,100 is what we're, is the population we're looking at on March 4th. While we're, waiting, while we're waiting for this model to come out, why not just tell these soldiers to go and get a medical examination? Just come right out and say, all right, we, we feel there may be a problem here. Tell them to report for a medical examination. Get all these soldiers tested, even before the model comes out. We're talking about large numbers of soldiers, and I think we have to have, uh, we have to approach this responsibly. And taking, uh, uh, Making an announcement that might scare people into thinking that they have problems they don't have would not be responsible. So one of the issues is how do we identify the group of soldiers we think should be tested or, or contacted? That's what we're working on. That's the whole one of the points of the, of the CIA model is to help us be, be a little more targeted in our approach. Do you think I mean, 700,000 people served in the Gulf War. We don't want to create a situation, and we've worked very hard not to create a situation where we um, uh, raise the specter of, of, uh, of health problems that, uh, that may not exist. David. And for you to make such a uh, drastic upward revision as you did in the estimates of troops who might be exposed, somebody obviously who was working on this program told you something uh, to convince you that this problem was much bigger than the 5,000 problem. What is it that you learned to convince you that the, the estimate of number of troops exposed had to be so drastically revised upwards? The question is level of exposure. And if you, given certain assumptions of wind, of, of amount of ordnance exploded, um, uh, and the direction of the wind, um, uh, the num depending on those assumptions, the numbers can vary over a wide range. I think ultimately what you're likely to get is a range of possibilities. And um, I can't give you precise figures as to the range of possibilities, but... Um, but you knew that when you were, back when you were making the estimates of 1,100 and... Uh, I didn't know that, as a matter of fact. Um, I had no information about the CA model back then when we talked in June or when we talked in mid-September about this. But I think the, um, the lesson that, uh, that I should learn from this and that we all should learn from this is that we should probably wait until we get better information about how the dispersion might have worked before we speculate. Because I made it very clear that I didn't know what the figure was, but that it was likely to be larger than 5,000. I still believe that's true. You said certainly larger than 15,000, as I remember. I mean, it was a, it was a drastic revision. Well, I think if you, it depends a lot on how far out you follow the agents. But yes, I'd say that we, that under some circumstances, we will have uh, numbers in that area. But I think we should wait and see. The question will be what level of exposure and whether the level of exposure makes a difference. And that will be the type of thing that scientists will study for some time. Of, of, yeah, the five, Jim. of the 500 who have been contacted, how many of them uh, are reporting symptoms that would fall under the Gulf War? I, I don't know the answer to that. Did, were they asked? <clears throat> well, they've been asked, I believe, to come to uh, register if they haven't already. But I don't know what the results of the conversations with these people are. Well, listen. Uh, 
two weeks ago you said 460 had been contacted. Uh, this is two weeks later. Right. Uh, so that's 40, uh, 20 a week you're contacting? Well, uh, I, I'm sure that you've had times in your repertorial career where you haven't been able to look in a phone book and find, uh, find the number of a source or the number is wrong when you do find it. We're talking about uh, records that frequently are old. Um, we're now in the process of trying to send uh, registered letters to these people. Uh, it has not been easy to contact all of them. But how, we, many, how many of the 460 are ill? I, 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 I just said I don't know the answer to that question. But it, there's a lot of information that's in this building that's not getting up to this podium. That, there, that is, a, uh, is uh, certainly uh, true. Well, that goes to the question of whether you're stonewalling and covering up. That's what the Washington Post editorial, see the Baltimore Sun editorial today? I've you seen, I've seen all the editorials. Problems. I find that these editorials are, uh, are, 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 uh, are painful, obviously. Um, I think that the editorials, in fact, are being generated because we have been more open in talking about what happened in Camasilla than in the past. And the reason we've been more open is that we have come across information that we didn't have prior to May and June when we made the announcement. Um, at every single stage, we have announced what we knew about the possibility of exposure. Um, it so happens that what we know has changed over time. But are you asking me, can I tell you uh, the, uh, the uh, health impact of every person who was around these explosions? No, I cannot. I don't have this information yet. And I'm not sure we have a systematic, um, uh, a systematic rundown of the results of talking to these 500 people yet. But I will try to get it. So Dana. On the subject of the pages that aren't there in the logs, uh, have you can you tell us now what the officer or the soldier who was in charge or supposed to be in charge of those logs during that day where she says she was. There was a question about whether she was in the hospital or at home sick or something. I don't have a complete picture of, uh, of what, if anything, happened to those logs. And I think until I do, I'd rather not speculate based on what um, one or two people may have told I'm us. I'm not even asking you to, I'm not asking for a complete picture or for you to speculate, just to say what the soldier who is supposed to be taking care of. I have conflicting that. information about those logs, and until I resolve the conflicts, I would rather not uh, talk about the conflicts in public. I'd like to see if we can get them resolved. Suzanne. Different subject. One more question. Yes. Uh, re regarding the uh, $5 million for the low-level studies, how long do you think it will be before there's any conclusion or whether you can tell whether you can be sick from low-level exposure? I think these studies will go on, probably likely to go on for some time, but I can't give you a precise time on that. Can you give us just a, a, a general reaction to the, uh, the Institute of Medicine report released in, the, in their main conclusions, particularly about lack of adequate record keeping and, and their other, whatever you think is the main finding of that report? If we had better records, um, tracing down this mystery would be a lot easier. Um, we're, we welcome the finding. We welcome the recommendation. We're in the uh, uh, in the process of trying to develop a, uh, an electronic medical information system that can be uh, contained on a chip in a soldier's ID card, a sailor's ID card. Um, we're not there yet. That will make, um, uh, will make it much easier to uh, keep track of medical trends and events. Uh, you may recall that um, in January, in the early days of the Bosnia deployment, we had the Surgeon General of the Army come down here and talk about medical care in Bosnia. And one of the points he made was that we have learned a lot since the Gulf War. Uh, uh, for instance, in Bosnia, we uh, pre-deployed uh, uh, doctors uh, well before the, soldier, before the soldiers got there in order to do surveys of environmental and other health conditions. Um, we've done a better job of checking uh, soldiers out before they deploy during the deployment and 
part of the program is to check them out after they come home from the deployments more systematically and more aggressively than we did after the Gulf War. So we have learned from that, and um, when we're able to marry up uh, a more careful uh, clinical um, evaluation and care with an electronic record keeping system, uh, we'll be in a much better position to uh, uh, track down, uh, we hope, uh, the types of, of patterns that we've seen after the Gulf War. But we're still dealing with paper records, and as is, I would say, almost the entire medical care system in the country. How significant do you think the finding is that, that there was no evidence yet to, uh, to link chemical exposures to the illnesses or any, uh, any evidence that all of these illnesses were, in fact, related to the Gulf War? We have um, uh, that preliminary finding was announced by the Institute of Medicine uh, last year, I believe. This basically reiterated that finding. Um, we one of the frustrations here is that uh, we have not been able to find a uh, a common cause for the symptoms that are described as Gulf War illness. Uh, we don't have an explanation. That's one of the things that frustrates the, uh, the veterans, and it's one of the things that uh, has frustrated congressional committees looking at this. It's not from lack of trying. We are uh, limited by the, uh, by the evidence we have and by the way we interpret this evidence. We have uh, tried to stick with the science, and the science has led us to this conclusion. Pat. A year ago, they didn't know 11 tons of sarin had been put into the air uh, by uh Army engineers and come to see it, did they? That's right, and that's um, uh, we've only known that since, uh, as I said, since uh, uh, May and June when we announced it. Um, we're in the process of trying to find out what the relationship may be, but we do know one thing, and we've known this since 1991 when the event occurred, that there were not um, signs of uh, of acute illness or acute response um, at the time that this happened. Uh, so, and we, what we haven't been able to see is yet is, but what we're looking at in the light of this new information is whether there have been subsequent clusters of symptoms that may have been, uh, that may have been related to some sort of chemical exposure. We don't know that now. That's what we're trying to find out. That's the reason why we've approached this. Uh, and it's frankly one of the reasons, I mean, it's very clear that the whole geometry of this problem has changed since we realized that there has been low-level chemical, the possibility of low-level chemical exposure. Has there been any clusters uh, pinpointed? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Suzanne. Um, is the Department of Defense going to continue to allow military officers to uh, work on Capitol Hill and apparently what may seem to be partisan political activity? Well, without accepting the premise of that question, um, the answer is time will tell. Um, as you know, the Secretary has ordered a review of uh, military officers and civilians from the Department working on the Hill. And that review is being done by um, by Assistant Secretary Pang or being directed by him. And it's uh, supposed to be completed on November 1st. And we'll see um, if there is a problem and how, and if there is, and I'm saying if, uh, what to do about it. But I think it's premature to say how we're going to respond until we find out exactly what the situation is on the Hill. Do you, do you have any figures on how many people are formally there under uh, uh, programs uh, and also then a number on the informal number of people that are detailed? I, I do not. There's a total of about 30 people, but I don't have the breakdown between fellowships and, uh, and being detailed at this stage. And one of the uh, problems with this is that um, this is an atomistic program. It's not centrally run in the department. It's run by, by each service and no one yet has pulled together the information. That's one of the things that uh, Mr. Pang will do. In fact, he sent out, uh, he's about to send out a memorandum to the services that asked them to provide him with this, this information with people broken down by categories. Ken. 
Charlie. One last shot on this thing. This, Which how, thing? How will this peer review thing differ from Dr. White's naming of, of asking the National Science Foundation to look? I mean, it, you know, all this smacks of That's a good question. spreading the blame around. Well, I mean, I, I'm sorry you see it that way. Um, you, you could see it as an effort to uh, try to solve uh, uh, complex problems or do the best we can to deal with very complex information. That's how I think you should look at it. The peer review deals with one small element, which is our efforts and the CIA efforts to calculate um, dispersion patterns of chemicals that, uh, that were blown up on March 10th and possibly on March 4th. That's what it's looking at. But the, aren't, there over, aren't there experts over the CIA and everything from wind direction to weather? And haven't they been consulting with, like, the National Weather Service on this thing all along? Of course they have. Of course they have. Well, then why can't they just come up with it? Well, it, um, because there are many, many variables. And how you treat those variables uh, has a big impact on the outcome. And the question is, are we making reasonable assumptions? This is clearly an emotional issue. It's a complex issue. It's an issue that deals with, with, um, with something that's very precious to people, which is their health. It's something that um, can generate uh, 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 great concerns by, uh, by soldiers and their families. And we want to make sure that we have the best possible picture or estimate of what happened on March 10th. That's what we're looking at. As, as, if it were easy to do, it would have been done a long time ago. If we had something to hide, we wouldn't be up here um, day after day talking about information that we released some time ago. We would like to get this behind us, and we hope this model will help us. Yes, Ed. When the, when the CIA sent over its, theoretically sent over its model last Friday, presumably it was satisfied with that model, and then it was looked at here and sent back and then sent back over. What was wrong with the model that the CIA sent you that you didn't accept it as being acceptable? The CIA did not uh, present us with a model to accept or reject. Um, the CIA came over and held some technical discussions with people in the Pentagon, and uh, they highlighted a number of questions about what they were doing, and those questions were discussed. Uh, they went back and, um, and did some more work. Uh, after that, they briefed uh, uh, Dr. Deutsch about the model, and it was he who made the decision that there should be some outside peer review, because it is uh, basically a whole series of assumptions. Yeah, but what specifically did the Pentagon find lacking in this when it came over here? As, as I said, I think that's too narrow a way to look at it. It was a discussion um, about assumptions and how assumptions could be made, and they were, they were extremely technical talks. Pat. There's ample records of the weather in that area, as Charlie pointed out. Earlier, you said it's going to be impossible to figure this out. There are ample records, and they conflict. It depends um, uh, where you measure weather from and at what time. Um, if we had had perfect meteorological devices um, right around the pit when, uh, and, and going out in all directions to measure wind patterns, um, uh, in real time over a 48 or 72 hour period, um, we would have a complete weather map. We do not have that. We have to vector it. We have to take um, information from a number of sensors, some of it taken uh, in real time, some of it not, and, and collate it in some way that makes sense. Real time photographs? Um, I have not seen all the evidence that is available. Real time what? A monitoring of, of wind patterns, for instance. Satellite I mean, monitoring? Well, I don't, um, I'm, I can't, I do not, I'm not aware of, uh, of all the factors we have, but there were various places where there were, uh, where there were wind detectors, wind measurement devices, and other things. There were meteorological stations in the area, but they were not right there. Some of them, one was in Kuwait, um, they were uh, not in the immediate area. So it's a question of tri triangulating information from a number of sources and trying to reconstruct wind patterns. It may seem simple, but it's not. Has your office come up with the best 
case scenario as opposed to a worst case scenario? Or are you working on something like uh, that? My office isn't doing this. Um, if my office were doing it, it would be helpful. I'd, we have people there with slide rules and, uh, and uh, addition sheets. Uh, the answer is no, and that's the issue. The issue is to come up with a decent range. Apart from Kamasia, the chemical logs show many detections or indications of detections in the early days of the war in January and February by the French, by the British, by Americans, by Czechs. And a lot of those indicate that or theorize <coughs> that perhaps that's from the fallout from the Allied bombing of sites more northern in Iraq. Uh, is there any research going on in this building or the CIA as to the possibility of, of that, those destructions of sarin gas and mustard gas drifting down over the battlefield some 150, 200 miles further south? Not that I'm aware of. Those were the issues that, were, uh, that, that arose in 1994 and 1995, whether there had been any exposure. Um, we, so knew, we knew that, um, and what did they find? It's <laughs> no. in the model. It drops short of, uh, of the troops at KKMC, but uh, there are others who have used NOAA satellites that show it went to KKMC. We are really behind a curve on this. We had no, uh, no convincing um, evidence that there had been widespread chemical exposure. Uh, and there's no attempt to ask any more questions about that at this point. That's a yes, issue. Yes, we're going back and looking at everything in light of this, but our main focus is on the troops around the Camasilla um, incidents. Are you saying you do have some reason to suspect that there were other uh, possible exposures? That's exactly the opposite of what I said. I said uh, prior to Camasilla, we had no evidence of widespread chemical exposure. To suspect that there were? Um, there were certainly instances, and some have been named here by Patrick and others, about, um, about dumps being or ammunition dumps being exploded farther in the north. But um, until we made the Camasi announcement, we did not have any um, reason to believe that there had been widespread chemical exposure. Camasi had changed it that was obviously um, a pivotal event because we learned that troops had actually planted explosive charges um, around chemical weapons and watched them explode from a distance. So in light of the Camasilla, there is some reason to suspect that there might be others? That's the whole point of what's been happening here. No, it's not. There's no reason to expect there might be others. We have to be open to that possibility. And in fact, one of the things we're doing is going back and checking if there were other examples of um, troops of blowing up ammunition dumps where there may have been chemical weapons. The reason that um, the Camas one of the reasons that the Camasilla incident took so long to discover was that our intelligence before the war and during the war told us that there were no chemical weapons in Camasilla. After the war, um, we learned that the uh, Iraqis had moved some chemical weapons to Camasilla and actually had once there had moved them around within the Camasilla complex. So we hadn't focused on Camasilla as a possible uh, storage depot for chemical weapons until after the war. Has the secretary received and or approved the uh, recommendation to inoculate all the troops with an anthrax vi virus? I don't believe he's received it yet, no. Yes. Uh, now that the uh, covering force has started to leave Germany and the I-4 troops are starting to leave Bosnia, can you tell us any more about the status of uh, reserve forces in Bosnia or potentially to be called up to backfill in Germany for the covering force troops that are now leaving? Uh, no. I don't have that information. We'll try to find out if it's available. Mark. You know the scope and purpose of this uh, internal Air Force review of the Kobar Tower bombing uh, that was done in parallel with the Downing report was and who authorized it? Um, I think the uh, important thing is to just wait until the uh, until General Record completes his review and then we uh, that will be the appropriate time to talk about uh, what happened prior to Kopar Towers. Doesn't this report sort of influence general record decision? 
general record will have to decide that himself. Do you know the timing on that? <coughs> well, he has 90 days to do it, and I think he was appointed on September 4th, so it'll be in early, uh, early December. Thank you.